Fourth of July weekend in Cleveland, Ohio. A time to celebrate independence. A time to be with family and friends. And a time to watch the Indy cars run at the Burt Lakefront Airport. This temporary circuit is as unforgiving as it is challenging. One slip in concentration can mean the end of the day for driver and machine. The bumpy runways take their toll on these high-tech cars and their world-class drivers. But there is a rich history on this sometimes treacherous race course. 1982, the first year Kart competed here. It was Bobby Rahal that outclassed the field to earn his first win in an Indy car. He comes here winless in 91, but is on top of the PPG points chase. 1986, when Danny Sullivan pushed his car to the limit, he led 59 of 88 laps and took the checkered flag. Now Sullivan is a three-time winner here, and he comes to Cleveland trying to help his Alfa Romeo team to its first ever win. 1989, Michael Andretti started on the pole and led the first 26 laps. Then, a collision in the pits with his father Mario gave the lead over to Emerson Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi went on to win the race, adding a PPG championship to his two Formula One titles. Today's race for Fittipaldi is a time to close in the points chase. Last year's race at this airport circuit saw both highs and lows. Allenzer Jr. moved up on the start from fourth place to take a commanding lead. But then tragedy struck when a pit fire ended Little Al's day. With the fire, Danny Sullivan inherited the lead and went on to take the checkered flag. But now, the Indy cars prepare to do battle once again on the airport runways. It's the 10th running of the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. a regular, fully operational air facility. But for this weekend, it belongs to the PPG IndyCar World Series. Hello and welcome to Cleveland. I'm Paul Page. We hope you're enjoying your 4th of July weekend. What an appropriate time to welcome home all the veterans of the Gulf War. As a matter of fact, to welcome home all veterans of all wars. Now, here in Cleveland, well, the tradition at the end of the weekend is the Indy cars to run on the Burke Lakefront Airport. And it's hot here today, firecracker hot, temperatures above 92 degrees. The course, because it's an airport, is also very rough. So, Derek Daly, how does that affect the run? Well, although this is a temporary facility, Cleveland really has produced some tremendous racing in the past. And one of the reasons for that is the runways here are 150 feet wide at some places. That's about four times wider than a normal road racing facility. Now, what does that do? It reduces the risk factor of making a pass, because if you do mess it up and get it wrong, chances are you can get away with it. Something else to consider? The heat factor. It's above 90 degrees here. When the driver puts on five layers of fireproof uniform, it's above 120 degrees in the car. It's a very hostile environment for the driver to work in for a two-hour period. So it's hot and it's rough here at the Burke Lakefront Airport. There's also the problem being reported now that in some places, the track is breaking up. We'll be back with more from the Cleveland Grand Prix right after this. of independence in Cleveland, Ohio. A week of festivities that's capped by the running of the Indy cars in the 10th running of the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. And today it's brought to you on ESPN by Budweiser, the king of beers. With that clean, crisp, cold taste, nothing beats a Bud. By your Toyota dealers and their quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. And by Quaker State. The big Q is one tough motor oil. So the Indy cars are approaching the halfway point in their season here on the shores of Lake Erie at the Burke Lakefront Airport, a, a race course that creates quite a challenge here. And one simply, when one has to think about challenges, remember back to the very last event at Portland as the drivers here are beginning to strap into their cars now. And think of that start when Michael Andretti worked his way up from the second row, jumped through the front row, shouldering aside Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi to take the lead of the race. Here's a view of that start once again 
Martin. Now watch Michael Andretti from the second row. Rick Mears darts to the side. No contact there. And then in the very first turn, Michael took the lead. He only gave up the lead for two laps during pit stops. Well, boy, now we have a very interesting front row. Emerson Fittipaldi is on the pole. Michael Andretti will start alongside. So let's go down to the front row. Gary Gerald with the pole sitter. Paul Emerson Fittipaldi has just been belted into the cockpit of his car with a new track record from the pole. Emerson, all of the talk about that start in the last race at Portland. How much does that concern you going into turn number one here and another wide open circuit? Well, uh, it's a very wide track. Um, very difficult to get the right braking point into turn one. Uh, but, you know, I spoke with Michael and we tried to have a safe start and safe beginning of the race. And, you know, behind is our junior and Rick and we, we should be okay. Have you talked to Michael Andretti about the start? Yes, I spoke with Michael and, uh, you know, for sure we are competing. But, you know, we try to respect each other. All right. Well, Michael is just about 12 feet to Emerson's left. Jan Bikas is right there. Thank you, Gary. We're here with Michael, and as we just heard Emerson say, he has spoken with Michael before the start. We had a wild one at Portland, but this time you don't have to bust your way through. You have a clear track. Do you have a different strategy here? Well, it's always different, and here it's going to be tougher, probably actually starting in the front row than starting the second row, because uh, the guys in, behind us can, you know, have a choice on what to do where we don't, so it's going to be an interesting start. Okay, Michael Andretti ready to try for his first win here at Cleveland. Paul? That's the front row. They're buckled in, set and ready to go. Michael Andretti and Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, the wings on these Indy cars play as much larger role than you might think. And Danny Sullivan explains in this week's Tip from the Cockpit. Well, it's quite funny that we're here at an airfield when we're talking about lift and downforce. For example, an airplane taking off has its wings set in a certain way that gives it lift to get it up into the air and keep it into the air during the flight. But for a race car, we're trying to stay on the ground. So we have our wings reversed to an airplane where when the air flows over those wings, it pushes the car down, which gives it more grip to the wheels and keeps the car on the ground and gives a great cornering through all the, the tight corners that we use. The trick at any racetrack, whether it's a fast track, racetrack like here in Cleveland or a tight track, is finding that balance between downforce and drag, which is how slow the car will go down the straightaway because you have too much wing in it. So the trick is to get that fine balance of where you have just enough downforce, but you're also fast down the straightaway. And that makes it very edgy to drive when you're really trying to do a trick qualifying lap or even during the race because you want just the minimum amount of downforce to give you the maximum amount of grip. Here at Cleveland is probably one of the more critical tests of downforce and drag. You have to find a good amount of downforce because the corners are quite tight. You're coming off of, a, of, a, of an asphalt onto a, a concrete. That's very tricky and it needs a good amount of grip. So you need a good amount of downforce. But the straightaways here are so long and so fast that you, if you get too much downforce, you're gonna be slow on there and you're not gonna be able to pass anybody and you're gonna get passed a lot yourself. So trimming out those wings, absolutely critical here at what is now the IndyCar's fastest road circuit at the Burke Lakefront Airport. Well, it's time now as we go down to the starting field. Here is the governor of Ohio. Gentlemen, start your engine. again Michael Andretti Emerson Fittipaldi there's Emmo as he considers the challenge of the day not the least of which is the tremendous temperatures here there is a slight respite from the heat above 92 degrees because of a light breeze that blows across this track in the second row there is Al Unser Jr. the defending PPG Cup champion and Michael Andretti outside the front row he can look across just to his right and see Fittipaldi Danny Sullivan Alfa Romeo power be their first win here today and Rick Mears the second of the Penske entries here today and John Andretti his first win this year they all sit ready to go up and down the field the indication is that everyone is in fact started the engines sometimes very difficult to start in this heat 
are all started and we're set to go. These methanol-powered Indy cars, producing over 750 horsepower, each now roaring out its challenge. And in just a minute, the field will begin to roll away. We'll be back. Pace cars in front of the field now on this very hot day, beginning to work their tires into shape. The starting grid is brought to you by the Die Hard Battery. Now, with more power when you need it most. The pole sitter with a new track record is Emerson Fittipaldi, a two-time winner of the Cleveland Grand Prix. Outside is Michael Andretti. He's won two of the last three IndyCar events. The second row, Al Unser Jr., winner of the 1985 event here on the shores of Lake Erie. And Rick Mears, this year's Indianapolis 500 winner. The third row on the inside is Mario Andretti. He hasn't won an IndyCar race since his triumph here at Cleveland in 1988. And Scott Pruitt, who ran six two years ago in his only Cleveland effort. The fourth row, Bobby Rahal, winner of the inaugural running of the Cleveland Grand Prix. And Ari Leyendijk, who won on the Phoenix Mile in April. The fifth row, John Andretti, winner of the season opener in Queensland, Australia. And Scott Goodyear, a young Canadian who has three straight top ten finishes. The sixth row, Danny Sullivan, his first career IndyCar win came on this course in 1984. And Eddie Cheever, three third place finishes all on road courses are his best in the IndyCar. The seventh row on the inside is Scott Brayton, making his seventh start here at the Burke Lakefront Airport. And Ted Prappas, who ran a strong sixth on the streets of Long Beach in April. The eighth row on the inside is Tony Bettenhausen, a journeyman driver who has a pair of top ten efforts this season. And Jeff Andretti, the youngest member of the famous Andretti clan. The ninth row on the inside is Mike Groff, who finished ninth here last year in his third IndyCar start. And Willie T. Ribs, who enjoyed a strong run at Detroit just three weeks ago. The tenth row on the inside is Didier Taze, a Belgium driver making his fourth appearance at this prestigious event. And Buddy Lazier, the sophomore driver out of Vail, Colorado. The eleventh row on the inside is Hiro Mashusta, the sophomore driver from Japan, running his first full season in the Indy cars. And A.J. Foyt, who finished seventh here a year ago. And in the twelfth row, alone, is John Jones, a Canadian, making his first Indy car start since 1989. So there they are, the IndyCar drivers, Al Unser Jr., as they roll around this course on the pace lap. Let's go down to the pits, Gary Gerald. Paul, we're in the pits of Al Unser Jr. He, of course, the defending IndyCar champion, but fifth in points, and he's had some frustration. Tough finishes, little niggling problems have plagued this team. He hasn't gotten the victories that he was getting at midseason last year, but he has today his best starting position inside row two since early in the season when he won on the streets of Long Beach. But this team and Al both know if he's to get back into the real heat of the championship points battle, a victory at Cleveland or a very high finish is certainly a necessity today. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Thank you, Gary. This morning in the driver's meeting, there were two key elements that were discussed. One, of course, was the start. And Wally Dahlenbeck, the chief steward, said, if anybody passes before that start-finish line, you are going to be black flagged. So we'll keep an eye out for that. The second was, it seems as though the track might be breaking up. And obviously, up in the booth, both uh, Paul Page and Derek Daly can keep, keep an eye on that. Paul? We definitely will, Jan. The weather conditions, of course, 91 degrees right now. It should be hotter before the day is over. A chance of rain, but some cellular activity in the area that we hope doesn't affect this day. Perhaps it won't. Looks nice and clear right now. The field working its way around now. The completion of the pace lap is at hand. Beautiful view down at downtown Cleveland. And there are the onboard cameras. Let's take a look. Michael Andretti. We can look head on as Michael anticipates that green flag. And Bobby Rahal over his right shoulder as they now are on the straight, leading down toward the start-finish line and Al Unser Jr. So three onboard cameras here today as the field comes on to the pit straight. Emerson Fittipaldi, the pole sitter, on the left side of your screen, brings them down. The green flag is out and already they're racing. Look at Al Unser Jr. as he darts well to the inside and begins to challenge Fittipaldi as Michael takes a wide line to the outside. And Al Unser Jr. for the moment pushes his nose ahead and picks up the lead, just like Portland, but a different name, a spectacular move on the start. What a great move down the inside by Alonso Jr. It's 100 feet wide leading to that first turn, but he got inside Emerson later on the brakes, and Emerson had no choice but to let him through. But did you see the funnel effect of the cars behind them? How can they all get through without touching wheels? Well, you mentioned it right at the start of the show. It's so wide here that you can take chances you ordinarily wouldn't. So it's Alonso Jr., followed by Fittipaldi, and then the Andretti's, Michael, then Mario. 
they thread their way through a chicane and you see as they kick up there that is one of the rough sections out in what we call the east loop here at cleveland now coming back toward you at this point on the track as they accelerate to top speed take a look at the ripples that they run over it's a taxiway normally at this airport derek that's right this is a very slippery area you'll see the dark shadows there it's very very slippery there it's a surface sealant they put down they had a lot of trouble early on the practice session but look at emerson having a look down the inside and apaldi comes to the inside as they head back to the first corner and he takes the lead back over from al Unser jr so better apaldi back to the front but look at the line the little al uses he cuts the corner tight as he comes off they're on the lakeside straight now and they're running side by side great racing but look at emerson tries to go down the outside michael and did this to him at the start of the race last year and he pulls it off slams the door flat on al Unser jr now back to a section of straightaway leading to a four corner east loop very difficult section michael comes up to challenge little al as fittipaldi has an advantage in the corner and begins to pull away great racing room here this is turn six seven and eight very bumpy just look at the bumps inside michael's car another one here puts a wheel off the apex right there al jr kicks up some dust but michael andretti about to give al jr about to fill his mirrors in a quaker state on board camera shot there you also get an opportunity to take a look at how rough it can be in some of the corners we'll expand on that just a little bit later but fittipaldi now begins to pull away the battle is between michael andretti and al Unser jr it is a fight for second with mario closing in right behind his son and then bobby rahal right behind rahal take a look at that that's scott pruitt now there is a chassis that they're having some problem Derek daly with the power but here that true sports chassis seems to be working very well and the reason i think is because this car is a very good handling car has good downforce very fast through the corners so the horsepower that they need on long long straights is not as critical here but a good day a good afternoon by scott pruitt so far and very good through every qualifying session here pruitt trying to catch up with bobby ray hall the battle for fifth place pruitt currently runs in sixth at the front of the order it's emerson fittipaldi followed by allenser jr Michael Andretti, Mario Andretti, then Ray Hall, then Pruitt. Ari Leyendijk is back just a little bit behind the 11 car. The Budweiser machine is Scott Pruitt. You can see the bright color of Ari's car, and it's brighter this week because now there's virtually no sponsor on it at all. Remember at Portland, we talked about the possibility that he wouldn't be racing here. They worked a little bit on the effort. Ari is here, but not without a great deal of tension. At the front, there's Fittipaldi. Take a look at Michael as he lines up, trying to catch an inside line on Al Unser Jr. And the two of them battle again, going into the first corner on this course. Oh, and he does get him. He does get by Al Unser Jr. So much racing room to slide down the inside. Really gives a great opportunity. But Al Jr., he made a pass there earlier on. Oh, and Mario goes down the inside. Mario comes underneath Al Unser Jr. And Mario and Michael both now have moved ahead of Al Unser Jr., but little Al not having any of it he's coming back to battle the elder andretti and mario slaps the door shut on on little al my word what a risky move that was turn five mario tried to go down the inside al jr or tried to go on the outside al jr was going to make him work very very hard they got so close but al jr i think made a wise decision and backed out a very very close wheel to wheel racing at the front of the field it's emerson fittipaldi still and scott pruitt with a problem as they push the car to the edge of the course any indication that that engine's running they're going to try to get him off the course or get him restarted Car safety vehicle is right there we'll keep an eye on pruitt while we keep an eye on the front of the field the white flag with the crossed red stripes and it indicates that there is an emergency vehicle on the circuit the battle at the front continues as they're on the lakeside straight and just ahead of them is that car of Scott Pruitt as Fittipaldi now cycles through the chicane. Ray Hall should be on top of it just in a matter of seconds. They've got Pruitt clear to the side now and should try to get Scott Pruitt running again. And Emerson Fittipaldi continues at the top of the order, but Michael Andretti continues to challenge, followed by his father. We'll be back. Machine with Chevrolet power runs in front, and you saw just as he went through that corner, that puff of smoke. The smoke that you see is actually some dust 
from the repairs that they've made in several of these corners. That's right. Yesterday we had a Trans Am race here, and the cars are so heavy, they really chop up this pavement. This was repaved now before they came here. But the Trans Am cars are heavy. It's tremendously hot yesterday. It literally churned that pavement up, which really was a major problem. Let's get down to the pits. Gary Gerald has a report on Scott Pruitt. Scott Pruitt came in under power. They started a routine change. It was apparently a spin in one of those transition areas, Paul. But as they were ready to bring him off the jacks, the man at the left rear pointed emphatically at the suspension. They've killed the engine now, and now they'll try to assess the damage. This has ominous overtones for Scott Pruitt, and they had such high hopes today coming into this event. But apparently a problem in the suspension at the left rear is the concern of the crew right now. From what we're seeing, it looks like it may be the end of the afternoon. Of course, the question that you would have, Gary Gerald, is whether or not it's suspension or if it has to do with that transverse gearbox as we are watching. Mario Andretti hold off a challenging Al Unser Jr. in a fight for third place. Little Al on the pit straight came right up alongside the elder Andretti as he is doing now. And boy, take a look at this view from the Quaker State onboard camera. And still, it is Mario that seems to be much quicker in those corners. He really is. Boy, it's very, very difficult to outbreak someone like Mario. We see Al Julia creeps down the inside, but unless he can get his car alongside Mario, you can't hope to get to the apex first. So he backs off, which is clever, because he wasn't ready to make it. He'll have to wait till later on. Now you talk about outbreaking th at this track. That's a very, very important fact. You're discovering, Derek Daly, that the style one uses for braking is changing depending upon the driver. Well, that's right. I mentioned in the Portland race about Rick Mears using his left foot. Well, I've since discovered Al Jr., not only on oval track racing, but on all road races, uses his left foot, as does Bobby Rahal. And that's an unusual style they have developed. And Rick Mears believes that this actually helps him because at the end of the race, when your feet get tired, you may miss the brake pedal. He said he never misses because he only uses his left foot stays on the throttle. So that's something new that I've learned and I'm sure everybody else has, uh, has learned also about road racing in particular. It probably involves significant retraining with some of the drivers and could be an absolute factor here because they should be very tired for the end of the day. Again in the East Loop, the number six car, the Kmart Haviland machine that belongs to Mario Andretti. We're on board with Al Unser Jr. right now. One of the competitors here, A.J. Foyt, had a little problem just a little bit ago. We can show you that problem. AJ, very, very high off the corner. Exiting turn seven, just gets a little bit too wide, drops those outside wheels onto the grass. Of course, that precipitates, can I say that worth the spin? One simple 360 and gets on his way. But AJ Ford not having a good day, qualified 22nd. Hero Mashusta right behind, had to climb on the brakes. That was corner seven, too. Might be a little anticipatory to suggest that that's totally AJ, because that's one of the corners that's breaking up. He might have just gotten loose running through that corner. That's right. Earlier today, we had another race, and the marbles offline, which get thrown up by the race cars running through the groove, is what causes the trouble when you go a little bit wide. That looks like what may have happened to A.J. Foyt. Fittipaldi is still alone in front. Michael Andretti is second place. The battle is Mario Andretti and Al Unser Jr. for third. We can get an update on the Scott Pruitt situation now from Gary Gerald. Well, here on the pit wall, one of the wheels from Pruitt's car. And as we come right in here, you can see there was contact with another car. That triggered the spin. The damage was in the suspension at the left rear. The wishbone has been bent. The crew quickly pushed the car away from the wall, back toward the paddock area. Pruitt stayed on that side of the wall, didn't get a chance to get a word with him. Great disappointment for this team that's been battling so hard with the development of an all-American car. Yeah, but an excellent and important update, because the question that would immediately go up and down pit road is whether or not that problem developed as a result of the roughness or contact now that we know it's contact the good news is that everybody else can breathe a little easier it didn't beat the car to death running over rough sections of the car of the course that's right and of course scott Cruz with that true sports car they really need a good result and he was right there in the thick of that battle in that first group of, of, of six people he maybe got a little bit anxious trying to make the move wasn't enough room and then there was contact as day is done. Out in front, Fittipaldi cycles around A.J. Foyt. Fittipaldi, the record-setting pole sitter here at Cleveland. For the first lap, Allenser Jr. jumped in front, then Fittipaldi took it away from him, and now Allenser Jr. has cycled backwards and has moved back to fourth place where he's locked in a battle with Mario Andretti for third place. Front of the field, the class of the field remains Fittipaldi as Carl Haas 
tries to keep track of his drivers. This summer, you can win one of 50,000 prizes worth over... Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland for the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. There's your leader, number five, the Marlboro Machine of Emerson Fittipaldi. The fight still remains at third place. Allens are junior and Mario Andretti. And as they come across the line, little Al gets past Mario. Just as they run into the chicane, now little Al has moved up into third place. We'll keep a focus on this. That's Bobby Rahal in the number 18 car. The Franco machine just behind him. And look at Mario. Mario comes back and he cuts inside little Al. Little Al really stopped the brakes there. And little Al is back inside him again, trying to make a run down the inside. But Mario's on the outside. What's going to happen here? This is the long, long run to the infield. Oh, what a great race as Al Unser Jr. now comes up to challenge. This is the, the demonstration of just exactly what this sport is right now. Mario Andretti, the great veteran with an incredible string of wins. His last one coming here in 1988. And Al Unser Jr., the new strong champion. The two generations fighting one another for third place here right now. Fittipaldi still the leader. Michael Andretti running alone in second place about three seconds behind Fittipaldi. We'll focus on this fight for third. And what a great fight it is. The only problem is when they fight among themselves, it does allow Michael and Emerson just to creep away, and that's what we've seen here. But this is where Al Jr. made the pass earlier. That's probably the most difficult outbreaking maneuver on the race track because it's so slippery there. There's about two car lengths behind them now. Things will settle down between Mario and Al Jr. for another lap or two. Looking at the front of the field, you saw the interval there between Emerson Fittipaldi as he came through the first turn and Michael Andretti about mm, a little over two seconds just behind now as they come up to the top speed. Fittipaldi was one of the very first ones, by the way, to note with his qualifying speed above 140, 140.8 miles an hour, that this is now the fastest road course in IndyCar racing. That's right, he just left John Jones, so already he's in the traffic here. Emerson did get by quite nicely. Remember, traffic can hold you up a tremendous amount if you have to back off the power, because the speeds are so high. So now Michael has to deal with the traffic. Things that might be of concern here today in the Cleveland Budweiser Grand Prix. Well, one is certainly the roughness of the circuit. We mentioned that. Number two is the heat above 92 degrees now. It's very, very hot, much hotter than 92 in those cockpits. Some of the track is breaking up. We normally bring up fuel, but it does not appear that fuel is in fact a problem here today. The only way that it might be a problem is because this circuit is so long at 2.3 miles, you have to get your pit stop right dead on the money if you want to make this a two pit stop race. Let's get an update now from Jan Vegas. Well, you're right, Paul. Fuel is not a problem here in the pits as far as that's not the big buzzword here. What everyone's talking about is the track. In other words, that might change the strategy of the pit stops if they have to go full course yellow to clean this track. And I'm here in the Allens or Junior pit. They've had no reports of chassis problems right now, but of course he's got his hands full. Paul? At the front, it's still Fittipaldi. And you see that the teammates now, with that battle with Mario Andretti, the little Al's been embroiled in. You saw it happening. Bobby Rahal, his teammate, has been able to move up. Now they're cycling past the 12 car right now. And Bobby Rahal, he's a center of attention of Maury Crane, who is normally sitting up in the pits. But Maury had back surgery out in California last week. So he's not here to cheer his driver on, but I'll bet she's sitting in the hospital right now with nurses saying, Mr. Cranes, please sit down. Quit cheering for him. That's right. It's amazing how the adrenaline is probably flowing in that hospital bed just as fast as it is, in, as it is at Ray Hall's cockpit here. We do wish Maury well. We know he's had this back problem for quite some time, but let's hope he's all taken care of. Finally, he's taken care of it. And here is Fittipaldi in front of the field. And some pretty hefty laps, averaging 134.9 miles an hour right now. 85 laps, the scheduled distance here. That's just a tick over 201 miles, 201.37 miles an hour. Fifth place, Bobby Rahal. Rahal's number 18. He makes his turn into the corner out the east loop. Boy, take a look at this in the Quaker State onboard camera. Watch his hands. Also watch his helmet. Look the way it bobs and weaves when he goes over the bumps right there. Notice he also uses a helmet strap. Again, an idea of just how fast a road racing circuit is, because that's normally the strap he uses for oval track racing. Ray Hall now comes onto the pit straight as we'll just follow him around this plan, this section of the circuit. There he's on the pit straight now and closing down on that fight between Mario Andretti and Al Unser Jr. once again. Little Al has managed to pull back up and get at the back end of Andretti and he's begin to worry him. 
this is definitely where the action is. Now, Mario has a nice little cushion here, but Al Jr. creeps up under braking. You see it here, but Mario has that car well set up. It's so difficult. You can catch somebody, but really to make the pass, you depend so much on the guy ahead of you making a little mistake. But the key to... Oh, you see how much he closes up there? The key to winning is not making mistakes. But Al Jr. is quicker through all these twisty sections. But we're inside his camera car now. Hits the apex. Look at Mario. Goes right off the road. Kicks up some dust. Then you can hear Al Jr. get onto the get onto the uh, onto the power. Jan Vegas especially can help you with this kind of thing as we watch Shelly Unzer keeping track of Al Unzer Jr. as in his role as a former racing instructor at the Russell School out at Laguna Seca. But there's a way that you really have to watch what happens on a road course. Sometimes you'll see one car as we watch the battle for third and little Al darts to the inside but still can't do it as Mario sweeps across the front. You'll see the car behind appear to really suddenly close down on the car in front of it. That doesn't necessarily mean he's faster. It's just the first car is starting to break and the second car hasn't begun that cycle yet. What you have to look at is how they exit the corner and if after they're back to acceleration the interval is in fact closer, then you truly know what's going on. We're watching the battle for third place. Fittipaldi at the front, Michael Andretti in second. Nothing changing there. Mario Andretti now trying to hold off a challenging, in fact, somewhat desperate Al Unser Jr. driving for Rick Gallus. Al Unser Jr., whose last really good race occurred at the Long Beach Grand Prix and he would desperately like to get up with a good result here today and pull himself back up into the points fight. Rest of the field on the pit straight now. Here comes the fight for third. There's Mario, the Kmart car. That bright red number six. In fact, that's how you tell the difference between Michael's car and Mario's car. Red roll bar, red number. Look at this. He's going to go down the inside. He is going to make the pass. He's fast enough this time. As Mario Andretti stays on the outside. Whoa, almost cuts him right off the corner. Mario clips the brakes as Al goes out and uses a little extra section. Now that's what you call closing the door. Because Al Jr. was actually alongside. Mario said, I'm not going to have any of this. Slams the door shut, cuts right across in front of him. And I would think there was inches between the cars touching right there. That's where you almost want to put, don't try this at home. Because I'll tell you, it's only drivers of that caliber. And maybe there are only 12 of them in this field that can race that close together with one another. That's right. It's really close racing. Great closing the door. What a lesson for people to learn. But Mario, one of the hardest men to pass. Now what happened was Alan Sir Jr. got a very good run out of the last chicane and we can take a look at that in replay and just see exactly how Mario closed the door. Here it is. Al Jr. comes down the inside now. I think he's right along beside him here. Has the apex. He thinks. Look what Mario does. Comes right across the outside. Right there. Almost clips Alan Sir Jr. Says no. I still have the corner. You've got to work a bit harder. And away they go. That's what you call close race. And in a normal circumstance one would say well little Al has the line Mario's going to be forced off and go slower and Mario just says nope I'm going right through here no matter what the battle for third continues Mario Andretti occupies it now little Al is right behind him and then his teammate Bobby Rahal sits back running in fifth place the leader is this car number five Emerson Fittipaldi continues at third place as Emerson Fittipaldi occupies the lead followed by second place Michael Andretti Mario Andretti is in third but Alan Jr. Bobby Rahal have both closed down right behind and not far back is Ari Leyendijk as well trying to catch up to that pack so there's a whale of a battle developing right here and we're keeping an eye on it we are. Now, what happened there is Alonso Jr. was a costly move trying to get by Mario because by the time he gathered up his momentum again, he actually lost about two or three car lengths. It has taken him a lap and a half to pull away from Bobby Rahal, who was right behind him, and sneak back up towards Mario again. Once again, Alonso Jr. has closed in just behind Michael. And again, look how rough it is through there. And you get every now Wow, look how much he'll allow closed up on that one. Can he hold that? bit better for Michael. Not much. But boy, are they running close. Okay, but he is very close. Now, remember, this is the last chicane. It's exiting this corner that Alonso Jr. is very strong, which puts him in a good position to challenge for turn one. So let's wait and see can he get close enough this time. Not sure he's close enough. Alonso Jr. tries the inside with Mario Andretti again. Decides, no, I have no chance with that one at all. Stays in line because he doesn't want to get caught offline too much. Now, he continues his pursuit of Mario Andretti. The fight is still for third place. Fittipaldi has 4.2 seconds on Michael Andretti, who runs in second place. And then this fight is about four seconds behind Michael Andretti. So still the front end of the 
this field is very, very close. We're in the first quarter of this run here, and look at Little Al as he gives it a shot again. This time he may have it, and he does. Little Al gets past Mario Andretti, picks up third place. But that's only the second time he's managed that. Mario took it right back last time. But well, this is where Al Jr. is quicker. This is turn seven. This is turn eight. Look at Ray Hook closes up on Mario, but Al Jr. pulls away about three car lengths. So Al Jr. is far enough away that Mario cannot counteract that move. Quicker stayed on board camera on Bobby Ray Hall's car now as he sits behind that fight and is now the man behind Mario Andretti. Al Unser Jr., by the nature of getting past Mario, now has a little bit clearer circuit running just ahead of him as he cycles down inside. And look at this. Look at Ray Hall as he tries Andretti. Now, will Andretti allow that? <laughs> they come around the court and they both push off a bit. Whoa! My word. Now, Mario tried to do the same thing, tried to keep the apex point, tried to keep the line, but Ray Hall forced the issue. Mario had no road left, so he had to use the grass, and Ray Hall makes a fantastic pass. wait just a moment until he can cycle through. Now we look out the back of the Quaker State onboard camera from Bobby Rahal's car. That's Mario. He's now around Taze and trying to chase down Rahal. And this really gives you a good impression of speed because of all the surface changes. The way he crisscrosses over that yellow line there, which is part of the taxiway, goes through the first S's here. You can even, you can even see here just how rough it is because the camera vibrates all the time. All different forms of surface as you move from airport runway to taxiway to some of the asphalt strips that have been laid down to allow the cars to get from one of those surfaces to another. And that can wreak havoc on both tires and suspension. And of course, the crews are watching both of those factors very carefully. Bob Ray Hall, I'm sorry, we saw the dust kicked up. You mentioned that earlier on. When the outside tires go across that white patch, which, which they put down early this morning, it does kick up some dust. And that's what we spoke about earlier on, about the track giving problems are beginning to break up. The number 18, Craco STP machine of Bobby Rahal. He runs in fourth place right now. He is the current PPG points leader. We spoke to him about the frustration of not yet winning a race this season. To win, you've got to run up front. And we're running up front. We just haven't quite made that cleared that last hurdle but um, you know all I have to do is look at last uh, last race at Portland you know the the, the Craco guys uh, you know I passed one guy in the race they got three guys for me and when you have that working for you then you've got and the car is working well and you're, <coughs> you're driving well one of those days everything's gonna mesh and um, so based on that no frustration yet but uh, three months from now ask me that question <laughs> the order seems to have stabilized. Bobby Rahal now occupies fourth place alone. Vittipaldi is still the leader. Michael Andretti is in second place. Al Unser Jr. is third. Bobby Rahal fourth. Mario Andretti behind Rahal. Sixth is Ari Leyendijk. Seventh place, John Andretti. Rick Mears runs in eighth. Eddie Cheever is in ninth. Scott Brayton is in tenth. Down a little further in the order. Danny Sullivan, 11th. Ted Travis, Ted Travis, 12th. Mike Groff, 13th. Buddy Lazier is 14th. Nice ride for Buddy. Didier Taze, 15th. Jeff Andretti, 16th. 17th is Tony Bettenhausen. Hiroma Schuster is 18th. And John Jones runs in 19th place right now. Two cars so far out of the race. Scott Pruitt, you saw that. And now, we hate to report it, but Willie T. Ribs. They had a problem there indicating with the engine of the car. And Willie T. might be having a problem. Andretti now with Rick Mears right behind him. Brain, if every time we see this, has to do a little flip because John Andretti drives in the car that Rick had for so long with those Pennzoil car colors. Now Rick Mears in number three turning over to the Marlboro colors for this season. And take a look at this little fight. Fight for eighth place. Again, this is Chevrolet Power versus Cosworth, so I fully expect John Andretti to pull out and make the pass on Didier Thayer. Didier lets him go, sees Rick. No, Rick doesn't squeeze through. That's a problem when lapping traffic. The driver that's being lapped sees the first car, but he doesn't always see the second one, so he cuts in as we saw Didier Thayer do there. Then he moves wide and lets Rick get on with his battle with John. So we take a look at the full field rundown after 20 laps here at the Burke Lakefront Airport, and we continue to watch the battle between John, or John Andretti and Rick Mears. Mears 
who was very good in the qualifying session early on, and in fact, during the qualifying, Rick Mears and Fittipaldi had the top speeds through most of the session. Then the Newman Haas team with Michael took a gamble. They really had the car running light on fuel, so light, in fact, that he ran out of fuel right after the timing line. And interestingly enough, the timing line here is well before the start-finish line. If they'd actually been timing at the start-finish line, Michael Andretti probably wouldn't be sitting on the front row for the start of this event. But Rick Mears, car number three, as he cycles around now, and that's John Jones in the number 12 car. Emerson Fittipaldi runs the front of the field. Michael Andretti second. Al Unser Jr. is third. We'll be back with more from the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Front airport as Emerson Fittipaldi runs at the front of the field, cycles off of the runway and onto the taxiway. And if he had a full set of wings turned the other way, he'd be airborne right about now. Fittipaldi running at a tremendous pace of 135.3 miles an hour. But now we come to a most critical time in this event because we are in the window of pit stops. And with a long circuit, Derek, you can't make a mistake. Oh, you absolutely cannot make a mistake. This is when you depend on everybody as a group because when you come into the pit lane, as Ray Hall is now, we pick him up in a second, but the pit lane can win or lose the race for you. So Fittipaldi should be due into the pits at any time. Five of his 13 wins have come on temporary road circuits. Two of those have been here. So we watch a two-time champion at this particular event as he cycles along. Here is the Gallus Craco team making their first of what they hope to be two stops for Bobby Rahal. Seems to be just a bit early, but it also seems to be well within the window. He stops on lap 26, his lap 26. That should carry him all right, though they would really like to get a little bit further. Nice clean pit stop for Rahal. Nobody in his way. He was the very first man to stop. He had a clear run all the way to his pit lane. In fact, there was nobody in when he was leaving. The leader of the race, Emerson Fittipaldi, now on the pit lane, and Gary Gerald waits for him. Let's go to Gary. Along with the Penske crew, we now see the nose of the car. Emerson hits those important marks right on target. Had to lock the brakes just a little bit. Car is quickly up. Eddie Cheever flashes by after his stop. They did not indicate that there would be any kind of a suspension or wing change. We don't see anything at this point. All routine, engaged gears, 14 and a half seconds we get, Paul. An excellent stop for the Penske team and the race leader when he came in, Fittipaldi. The crew chief, Rick Reinemann, stepped out there after making those changes, took a look at his car as he pulled away. I'm sure what he was looking at was to take one final look at the back suspension, and here comes Fittipaldi cycling in along inside Ari Leyendijk. And Rick Mears is in the pits, so the Penske team, you see Roger there in the background with his hand up, keeping track of Mears. Mears and Roger constantly on the two-way radio. And Richard Buck says, okay, Rick, take it back into the fight as well. So Mears is back into the battle. Michael Andretti, for the moment at least, picks up the lead of the race. Great pit stops by the Penske team. Remember, you can lose so much time just exiting this long pit lane because it's so long. Here's the leader of the race. Jan Bikas is there. The leader is in. Michael is keeping his streak alive of leading every race this season. He's radioed in saying he has a push. In other words, the front tires are sliding. Look for him to dive for the front wing. There it is. It's the front wing adjustment. It's going to put more downforce on the front of the car, which will haul it at the And Gary is down at the other end. Gary? Well, we're nearby, and it's Al Unser Jr. who is in for his first stop. Remember, this is a crew that had a disastrous fire at this facility a year ago. No obvious problems. Fuel gauge is disengaged. He's away in just over 14 seconds. We're seeing some scintillating stops in the heat at Cleveland. So many of the leaders have made their stops now on board. The Quaker State on board camera, Al Unser Jr., as he comes off of the pit road and now for the very first time actually rejoins on the race course itself. So most of the leaders, Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr., Mario Andretti, have all made stops and now hope to make just one more before this race is over. These pit stops are almost scary because the speed these cars have to get down the pit lane. When we saw Emerson stop, we saw him lock up those front wheels, slide absolutely onto the correct spot. And remember, if he doesn't hit the correct spot, the man with the fuel hose sometimes cannot get the fuel hose in. So it's critical that he stops exactly right and then leaves. Here comes Mario Andretti into the pits. Jan Vegas. Mario Andretti is in. He's getting the best fuel economy of the top runners so far. We'll have to see if that's going to change the outcome of the race. Again, more adjustments on the front wing, so he must have a very similar... No, Mario is saying, no, don't change that wing. I like how the car is. Now he's waiting for the fuel. It's off the deck, and he's out of here. So much 
punches conveyed and a very quick gesture. You saw it there. As they look down to the cockpit, Mario with a few hand signals tells exactly what he wants. Mario Andretti, whose last win in the IndyCar came here in 1988, comes back into the fight as well. He did have the lead until he came into that pit stop. So again, they cycle through. Everybody seemed to be within a window, though it seemed that Ray Hall was just a little bit early. Certainly Ray Hall was on the other side of the, or certainly Andretti, Mario was on the other side of the window and seems to be really in excellent shape. That's, that's right. And it's amazing what happens here. We, the people came off the racetrack, stopped, got fully serviced, and everybody went back out in the same situation. Look at this. These are some track. tires that just came off those cars. Looks like they've been rubbing up against something pretty hard. I wonder what caused that, Derek. I'd like to know whose tire that is. Maybe Jan or Gary can go and find out, because I think that looks like it put them in contact. Well, Jan Bikas has an update. This tire that you're looking at, it's the right front tire of Michael Andretti, and you can see he has made contact with another car, and looking at that very closely, he was lucky that not to get a puncture on that tire. Paul? Looks like some cord showing right through there. He must have gotten that up against something hard. Of course, the Goodyear Racing Radial is an amazing tire, and in this heat operating today, oh, what a magnificent job it does. Not only in just staying round like it should, giving these cars the acceleration and the braking that they need, especially on this surface. It's a tremendous challenge for the tire engineers here. So Mario Andretti, here's a look back to as he came out of the pit after that first stop. This is one of the scary moments. Just look at the acceleration and look at that rubber. He burns off those rear tires as he warms them up, which is good, and gets on a long, long way down that long pit lane. Remember, the pit lane here is the old part of the racetrack. Mario Andretti, number six. Kmart Haviland car has been 47 races since he has scored a win in the Indy car. How great it would be if he could get to the front of the order and take the checker. Now the kart safety team pulls out to the aid of the 15 car, the McKenzie machine of Scott Goodyear. He pulled off just by the edge of the course, not in any danger there, no indication of a major problem. But of course the car is not running and they're going to have to figure out how to tow it in, hopefully get it back to the pits and get Scott Goodyear, who has had a pretty good streak of top 10 finishes going back into the fight. The front of the field, Emerson Fittipaldi, after all the stop cycle two, still out in front by almost three seconds ahead of Michael Andretti. Al Hunter Jr. with an excellent stop, and you saw it, picks up third place. Bobby Rahal stopped early with a good stop, is in fourth place. Mario Andretti slides back into fifth. Ari Leyendijk up to sixth place, Rick Mears seventh, John Andretti eighth, Eddie Cheever ninth, and Scott Brayton is tenth. And this looks like one of those races where you hope somebody makes a mistake. Emerson does not make many mistakes. And the most frustrating thing for Michael, who we're watching here chasing him, is Michael can do perfect laps. We're inside his, on his, on his uh, in-car camera here. He can do perfect laps, no mistakes, laps after lap after lap and he doesn't even make up a tenth of a second that makes for a very long and hard day's work we were watching michael andretti his onboard camera there for just a moment michael andretti picked up the lead for one lap during that exchange of pit stops and in doing so michael andretti as we watch the quaker state onboard camera has now led in all eight races this year and as a matter of fact if you go down and look through the chart on laps led Michael Andretti has led far more than anyone else by almost two-thirds. But he just doesn't show that in the points. He's not been leading at the finish, but he is, after all, the only man this year to have won twice. Quaker State onboard camera, Michael Andretti, works his way out through the East Loop. Very, very tough section of the course. This, now, Paul, is the hardest section here. Watch his hand movements here. Jeff Andretti. Jan Bikas has an update report. 
down here in the pits, especially in the Andretti pits, they jumped all over these tires afterwards because not only can we see wing adjustments when they come in, by changing the tire pressure here, every one pound in the tire is like changing the spring rate of the car by about 50 pounds. So they came and they checked all the tires and then they got their calculators out and they figured out what they're going to use for the next stop. Paul? Of course, the next stop hopefully is the last stop. If you do it right, this is a two-stop race as we continue to watch the battle for sixth place between Lion Dyke and Rick Mears. And, of course, that stop is critical in terms of making any suspension changes that you make because you make them right, you make a faster car for that sprint run to the end of the race. And hopefully you make them right. We're with Ari Leyendijk here, overcoming a bit of adversity, I would say, here from a driver's point of view because of the controversy surrounding the team. There was an owner, then there wasn't an owner. Now Vince Granatelli takes it over. Ari Leyendijk is not in a good situation here from a driver's point of view because he has a lot of, any, of emotional decisions to make. And really, you don't need that type of distraction when you try and extract the maximum from yourself on race weekend. What was interesting as a crew chief on that car, Peter Parrott said, you know, there is one advantage. Fewer decals, the aerodynamics are actually better. The, the little width of the decal can make a world of difference. He says, the car's a little more slippery now, so maybe this is working out all right. The only problem is, the man who puts the decals on pays the bill. Puts a few bucks into the situation. So Ari Leyendijk with a very bright car, number nine here today. And I'll tell you, boy, what a great opportunity that would be for a sponsor to climb on a car that is lying fourth in the points. The heat here can be a real problem to these drivers. We decided to take a look at how some of them help keep cool. This track fact is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q is one tough motor oil. Now, here's Gary Gerald. Heat is always the enemy of a race driver, and there are various ways that drivers try to combat heat. Mike Graw has a cooling unit that's been adapted inside his helmet. It's very difficult to see, but there's a band in the inner shell that cuts right across the forehead, and also a similar band, about an inch wide, that runs all the way across the back. It's concealed inside the padding of the helmet, but you see this tube that comes out here. This is connected to this little hose right here, connected to this canister. And what you're seeing emitted here is a compressed liquid coolant. It pulses periodically into the hose and provides the cooling material inside the helmet. This canister is housed down in the nose of the cockpit, right between the driver's legs. It would appear to be a very tight fit and somewhat uncomfortable. The activation box where the driver controls how frequently it pulses the coolant is located right alongside him in the cockpit. What this does, you'll see that there are cooling vents for air that comes in and vents out the top of the helmet. But the actual cooling band that's built inside here is just like adding an ice pack to your forehead and one to the back of your head. It helps you keep your concentration sharp, keeps you mentally cool, and hopefully it makes you a much more efficient race driver in the heat. Cleveland Grand Prix, Michael Andretti has closed in on Emerson Fittipaldi and now is beginning to challenge. They come to a chicane just before the pit straight, and Michael Andretti is right there. Now remember, we saw him put two turns of front wing in this car during that pit stop. It obviously is working because he has clawed his way up behind Emerson. And in fact, he has made a couple of challenges to try and get down the inside. He's not quite close enough yet, but great in-car camera shots here of our second place man trying to catch this man, Emerson Fittipaldi. Emerson Fittipaldi's last lap was two seconds slower than the average he'd been running. And here comes Michael. Look at Michael cook the brakes as he gets wide. And Michael loses an advantage there. He missed just the corner and got hot on the brakes. Oh, he did. He locked up those front brakes. Luckily, he didn't get onto the grass. There's so much room here. Nan, or, uh, his wife, uh, Sandy, looks on. She can see everything that happens from her pit vantage point. But Michael overcooked the brakes there, went a little bit too wide, and was lucky to get away with it. He didn't get on the grass. Before I have a very angry Michael Andretti coming after me at the end of this race, is it possible that what he got on was some of the marbles from the breakup in that corner? Well, we mentioned that earlier on. That is one of the areas of the racetrack that we have had problems. That's where you see the white patches. If you do get a little bit wide there, you run across the marbles, and suddenly your grip is cut in half. That could have been what happened to Michael, but boy, did he close up fast on Emerson. Looked like he had fit a quality in a fight for the lead in that corner. And then into the corner, quick stab of the brakes, one that took him a little too wide. 
and you see the advantage that it has given to Fittipaldi once again. We'll have an opportunity to take a look at this one one more time. There's Fittipaldi. Now he's leading. Mike is a good three or four car lengths behind him, but he makes a very brave effort trying to get down the inside. Look at that right front wheel, locked up, locked up, loses the steering, out into the gray. Look at the dust gets kicked up, catches the car, gets a little bit sideways, and just keeps it off the grass. But boy, that mistake cost him about six or seven car lengths. And a marvelous piece of driving to catch the car and get it back on the line. Let's get an update from Gary Gerald. Well, the Penske crew for Emerson Fittipaldi believes that he may have missed a gear in that situation, allowing Michael Andretti to close so quickly. There does not seem to be any other great concern here as they watch from their vantage point on pit wall. Well, that would explain, Gary, the uh, time difference that we saw on the lap where Michael actually caught up because he caught up very, very quickly in the first corner. And having missed a gear would certainly explain that. And the gears, like the other suspension components in the back end of the car, are something you have to be so very careful of here because of the incredibly rough surface at the transition points between taxiways and runway. John Vegas just checked in with the uh, with the Andretti organization who says that there's no problem with the brakes on Michael's car. So the race continues as we take a look at the Pioneer Race recap. After 35 laps in this run, we've had no full course cautions, and Fittipaldi is setting a blistering pace of 133.5 miles an hour. Now try this one out. Danny Sullivan's track record on this course second year of this particular course. His race record here from last year is 112 miles an hour. Fittipaldi is now averaging 133. It's an incredible run, really. Remember, this is the Penske car. They design a new car for every year, and it's just a little bit better, and little bits being better in three or four different areas really gives you a big advantage. But remember, there's a long way to go yet, and what really slows down average speed yellow flag situation and in fairness to Danny Sullivan's last year run and a lengthy lengthy full course yellow that they've not seen here today 15 laps of full course yellow last year part of that owing to that pit fire with the uh, Al Unser junior car that took him out of the lead of the race as we watch Emerson he is one of those drivers that almost hits the same spot every single time every time we come to look at him he drives over the same piece of road all the time. That's what I said about earlier on. He's very consistent and very seldom makes a mistake, which gives everybody a hard day's job just to try and catch up. Bit of Baldi up now behind Hiro Mashusta as he cycles through some traffic, and Michael Andretti is just behind. The two leading cars, Fittipaldi and Michael Andretti, are a full 15 seconds ahead of the third place car, Al Unser Jr. We talked about wing adjustments. You saw some of them happen. For a further update, let's get a briefing from Jan Vegas. Down here, uh, Derek was just talking about that that wing adjustment may have been what made the change to Michael's car. Let's show you what happened when they turned that. They came in and turned this right here. What that does is raise that flap a little, giving some more downforce to the front, holding the whole front of the car down. Now, just in case you're interested, this whole spare nose piece that's sitting here costs a cool $20,000. Paul? No problem. That's, that's maybe six cars in my garage right now, $20,000. John Jones, the Canadian, being reported out of the race now with an engine problem. So three cars out, John Jones, Willie T. Ribs, and Scott Pruitt. Fittipaldi at 134 miles an hour now as he kicks the speed up a bit, is the leader of the race. But boy, look at the interval close down as Fittipaldi continues in the fight. We'll be back with more from the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Around the Burke Lakefront Airport with about a half a second lead on Michael Andretti now. The surface of this track are a concern to everyone, especially the leader, Fittipaldi. We asked him about the bumps and about the track's effect upon these race cars. It's very rough, but they improve, uh, like the chicane before the start-finish line. But I think that's one of the, the key things here is to adjust the mechanical suspension, the right aerodynamic for follow the bumps, follow the, you know, the undulation of the track, um, and get the right frequency on the suspension. So that's the key to the quick here. So Emerson Fittipaldi, what he's commenting about when he says it's better is remember that this course was changed last year. They took a, a little chicane, actually two turns out of it, after they had some problems with that section breaking up last year, and made this wonderfully long straightaway the pit straight that we see and it makes for that very wide first 
first turn. That's taken some of the bumps out of it, but still, you're only coming in for two days of the year. It adds an extra challenge, which these race cars respond well. It really does, and it was quite by accident, literally an accident with Ari Leyendijk when he hit the wall last year, that they reconfigured this racetrack, and it really is much better, much more liked by all the drivers, and as you say, less bumpy, and a much better racetrack. You can race it to turn one now, as opposed to what you had before. Bit of Pauly with Michael Andretti in the number two Kmart car just behind him. Still time to close in and very, very close as we continue to watch the fight at the front of the field. Al Unser Jr. We take a look in the Quaker State onboard camera. Nice clear run in front of him. Al Unser Jr. Looking superlative here today, especially compared to some of the runs he's had recently. He really not only wants but needs to get back up into the top of the order and run as well as he can if he's going to pick up some points and challenge his teammate Bobby Rahal who is the current points leader. And you know it's a hot day when Alonso the junior uses that little air intake tube on the right side of his cockpit there takes air from outside the car over his shoulder and he sticks it down into his uniform which puts cool air over his chest. All right let's go down to the pits now get an update from Gary Gerald. Intercepted Scott Goodyear, whose day was unfortunately too short. It seemed to be electronics that puts him out. Scott, a lot of people wondering, how tough is it? We know it's hot. We know it's bumpy. The repairs that were made on the course, how slippery, how treacherous? Well, at the very beginning, it didn't seem too bad at all. But uh, as the race progresses, there seems to be more and more marbles. And it's almost becoming like a path in the snow that you have to make sure that you're on. It's very hard to pass. Uh, right now, we had some problems with our McKenzie car and the electrical system. We came in and out a few times. It knocked us out of the top. 10 so we're done for the day it sounds like the conditions you're talking about mean a driver who wins this race is going to have to exercise great patience you can't get too much out of the car well patience and um, you have to be very cautious of the track because of all the surface marbles and the track is being torn up right now so it's very cautious and for them to get around lap traffic it's going to have to be patience and expertise we appreciate your insight thank you thanks okay. Paul? Quaker State on board camera, Michael Andretti, second place, and you got to watch a little bit of it as this battle for the lead heats up once again. Michael is trying to worry and and trying to worry Fittipaldi right out of the lead, and he's doing a pretty good job of it. He is really on top of Fittipaldi. He really is, and under braking in particular for turn three, that long, long braking right-hander. We saw him close up an enormous amount on Fittipaldi. Now, Fittipaldi will know that because he sees Michael coming in his mirrors, but what Michael says is, this is where I think I can make a move. I've got to get close, though, down to turn one. This is turn one here. He's got to be close here if he intends to make a pass after turn two into turn three. And Didier Taze, it sets just ahead of the fight as Fittipaldi with Michael Andretti right behind him coming to the faster sector of the course along the lakeside straight. And Fittipaldi cycles under Taze, and Michael quite wisely says this is not a place to try at this moment. Now in the of the circuit that Michael seems to have his best run. He comes up behind Pays and comes past him and the fight's at it again. Oh, the fight is at it again. Emerson cannot afford to put a wheel wrong here because Michael will pounce. Michael is driving the wheels off that Kmart car, but Emerson is just, just that little bit ahead of him all the time. A frustrating situation, but Michael is the type of driver that if half a chance comes his way, he's going to grab it as hard as he can. That's what we saw earlier on when he locked those front, uh, front wheels. They come off the furthest east point on this, the Berg Lakefront Airport, heading back toward the pits now, passing the pit entrance onto the pit straight. Michael Andretti still in pursuit with no other factors right now at the front of the field. And there is Michael closing down just a little bit more on Fittipaldi. In fact, he picked up about a half a second in that lap. Fittipaldi, of course, having to handle some traffic. Michael handled it in a different way, and that can make a world of difference. But Fittipaldi still at the front of this field we approach the 50th lap of this race scheduled for an 85 lap distance 201.37 miles in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix two very evenly matched cars here for sheer pace and speed but Michael I don't think has quite the pace of Emerson that's why he seems to be playing catch up all the time Michael needs some help from traffic if he's to close in on Emerson oh Rick Mears is in trouble Rick Mears on the pit road but very very slow and certainly you don't want to make a pit stop at this point in the race. Rick Mears doesn't even look like it's under power. One of the reports was, look at the, look at the left rear. That's the report. Yeah. He brushed that wall coming off of the east loop. 
He certainly got up against something fairly hard. There's only one wall to hit here, Paul, and it's coming off turn eight, and that's where we see Rick running very slowly from that turn eight situation. But that left rear suspension is broken. I would doubt very much if they will fix that. Just look at that left rear wheel. It's almost hanging off that car. I'd be surprised if they can get that fixed. Gary Gerald's right there, Gary. In our first look at it, we can see that there was definite contact on that left rear, and they'll now try to pull it off, but it looks like the suspension parts, well, we can see damage here, and even with our untrained eye at the rear, this is going to be a long stop, and we can see now that one of the lower wishbones is definitely bent. I can't imagine that he'll be able to continue, Paul. Boy, what a devastating development for Rick Mears, who came into this race with 76 points, second behind Bobby Rahal. Now, if he falls out at this point, well, there are no points at all, and he will fall well down in the order. One has to ask what's going through Roger Penske's mind, because Richard Buck and that crew could, in fact, go to work on that car, try and keep it somewhere in the point, in the fight, just hoping for some points, but it doesn't seem likely. We take a look again to the front of the field. Michael still trying to close down on Fittipaldi. That is John Andretti in the number four Pennzoil car, sitting just ahead, though not ahead in the order. John Andretti is well down in the fight, running in seventh place right now, a lap behind the leaders and about to go two down. On board, the Quaker State on board camera, Michael Andretti. Emerson Fittipaldi is out in front. We'll be back. Goodyear Blimp, high overhead, giving you some great shots of this course. 1991 brings the spirit of Akron, the name of that airship piloted by Drew Marshall. Here over the lake shore at Cleveland, and there is the battle for the lead as you see it from the blimp. And look at these two fight. Oh, this is Michael's going to go down the inside. He yes, I, he's, yes, he does have the move. He got down inside Emerson. Emerson had no choice. But now watch the run to the next two turns. Look at Emerson right back to the front. Michael very effectively used cousin John to uh, create a little blocking maneuver for him. But look at Michael. Michael's coming back around Fittipaldi, and this is the section where Michael is faster. Now Michael is out to the front of the field. Fittipaldi is in pursuit. John Andretti is staying right with him. And what a display from Michael. And we've seen Al Jr. do that earlier on with Mario. He slides down the inside of the hairpin, but you've got to slow the car down too much. Emerson got back inside, and then Michael does it again. Now, Michael is very fast through here, so he helped to pull out a couple of car lengths. But what a great maneuver to catch Emerson to stalk him for so long and then take the opportunity when it came. So much of racing is not just going fast. It's also knowing how to play the traffic. It's, that's prevalent on an oval, but you see it so much in road racing now, especially with a guy as, as moxie as Michael tends to be. Boy, he played that one well. So well. And we said earlier, Michael needs traffic. Now the roles are reversed. Now Emerson will be looking ahead of him, ahead of Michael, to see what traffic he can take full advantage of. Now John Andretti was running seventh. We said it ran, ran one lap down they caught him so uh, John Andretti is right there in the fight though falling a bit behind but it's interesting that that number four Pennzoil car is staying pretty much on the pace that the leaders are running it really is and you know after the the early success uh, that, that, that John had in Australia really you haven't heard much about him in the race since then but what they have been doing is quietly going about their business getting good race mileage and experience remember this is a very new young team and they've had considerable success immediately now they're in the, the learning curve as i call it all right in the pits rick Mir is out of the car is he out of the race here's gary gerald and paul we have him now getting a hat on and he's doing a, a quick radio interview at this point we'll uh, hang on and we'll get a word here we'll come back down when he's available Rick Mears. Boy, what a devastating position on the points this is going to have for Mears' car in the Penske team, the front of the field. It is Michael Andretti now. Fittipaldi relegated in the second place role, and Fittipaldi trying to catch up. Here it was the pass, Derek Daly. Michael got a great run off turns 9 and 10. He gets down inside Emerson, but now he's under braking. He can't quite make the turn. Look what Emerson does. Turns inside him. He's on the power. Emerson's on the power now, gets inside Michael. Look at Michael slide wide, look at that slide wide, almost onto the grass, but Emerson has a full car length ahead. But you know what happens? Michael then comes back down the inside in his favorite out-breaking position, slides down the inside again, we'll see it right here, and takes the position back. And I, I, is what happened there is that the exit speed that Michael had because he had the, the nicer swooping line out, that was a better speed for him? 
Well, I think it was sheer bravery that he actually made the move because he had so much room to get down on the inside braking for turn three. And remember, that was the one that he gobbled up Emerson so many times before. So he had confidence that he could actually pull it off. Sometimes it's technique, sometimes it's bravery. Let's go back to Kerry Gerald. And Rick now available. Obvious disappointment. What, what resulted in the contact, Rick? Well, I just made a mistake, basically. I, you know, I blew the corner. Got in a little hard and, uh, you know, I dropped the right front end close on the apron to you know, try to hook it underneath and hold the front end. I had a little bit fighting a bit of an understeer. When I did that, it, it hit a bump and blew, bounced the front end out because of dropping a wheel off on the inside. And that put me out into the marbles and then there was no hanging on from there. I just, uh, you know, I just made a mistake. Got it out of line. These are tough conditions because of the breakup around at various points in the track, aren't they? Well, it is tough, but uh, you aren't supposed to get off line. You know, it's okay if you stay on line. Uh, I got off line. That's, that's the problem. How devastating to the point hunt is this? Well, it's uh, it's devastating, obviously. Um, you know, I don't know what, where it's going to end up. We've got to see where everybody else finishes. and. And that's what I feel bad about. The guys did a tremendous job on a Marlboro car. You know, they've been doing a tremendous job all year long, keeping the reliability and everything, and then I put them out. All right, we go back up to Paul. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Rick Mears out of the fight, and as he suggested, will have a terrible effect upon the overall points battle. Michael Andretti leads this race, but consider this. Michael hasn't finished a race here at Cleveland since 1987. He can lead. He's had his problems going the distance. And here's Bobby Rahal. Coming in to make a stop from fourth place, Jan Vikas. Our current points leader is in. He grabs the water, of course. The way these guys are running, they're going to be sucking up the water during this race. It's very, very hot down here in the pits. Everybody looks pretty calm, pretty routine. Pit stop, Bobby's just waiting for fuel. It's in gear. He's out of here. And Bobby Rahal rolls back into the fight on lap number 56. Now, Derek, we've got to do a computation for that car. Michael's got a problem. Michael with a problem. Looked like he got over against. He comes back to speed. No. I think he's in good shape. Actually, what he does, he has a very unusual line coming off that last turn eight. And what he does, he comes off the corner right against the wall. Then he turns right because he gets out of that very bumpy area. That's why it looks such an unusual line. Fittipaldi's in. Here's Gary Gerald. And once again, Emerson right on target as he hits the marks for what he hopes will be his final stop. This time, he didn't have to lock the brakes. They've already completed the tire change. Now they bolt down the left rear, waiting to bring the fuel hoses out off the jack. 14.8 seconds, another great stop for this Penske team servicing Emerson Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi on lap 57 makes his stop and goes back into the fight, the lone hope of the Penske team right now as Fittipaldi goes back into the action. The leader of the race is still Michael Andretti. We'll be back with more from the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. Rolls in for a stop. Here's Jan Vikas. Michael Andretti bringing it to a stop. He's reaching for the water, getting that. We don't expect any changes here on the wings this time. It's going to be done just with tire pressures. Michael pretty much was very pleased with the earlier changes, just hoping to get in and out as quickly as possible. He's just waiting for fuel. Let's wait and see. Seems a little longer than normal. The air jack stuck just a little bit. And Gary, go ahead. Yes, indeed. Little Al Unser is right in as Michael speeds away from his pit. This was the second stop last year where they had the problem with fire. This crew efficiently working. They say they want a yellow. They're running as fast as the leaders. They got behind a bit early. Now they'll have to try to make it up on the racetrack. Now, wait a minute. Is there a problem at the rear? No, we got a problem here at the left front. They've gone for another air gun. Oh, my. The little problems that have plagued this team this year have again resurfaced. They're now nearing 30 seconds on the stop. There he goes. We've got him at 29 seconds. It was a problem with a gun on the left front that kept him in the pit twice as long as usual. And for about 150 feet, Al Unser Jr. was the leader of the race as he flagged past Michael Andretti. And as Michael came out, Emerson Fittipaldi was on the pit straight. But Fittipaldi was not able to catch Michael Andretti as they came off the stop. Michael Andretti is still the leader of the race. My word, the scary time we mentioned earlier on. It's incredible when something goes wrong, like an air gun like that. Panic almost sets in, but these guys are trained to actually slow down a little bit. Do your job as cleanly as you can, because if you lose 10 seconds, it's better than losing 50 seconds by making another mistake. Quaker State on board camera, Al Unser Jr. Not only do they train for the good stop, they in fact train for the one when there's a problem. They knew that if that one air wrench went bad, exactly where they get the backup from it. It's just like setting the starter engine over the car always. They'll set it over the wall in case the engine stalls. They're always prepared for every eventuality. That's what makes them so good. That's 
That's right, a good backup situation. But Michael had a great start. No changes to the car. It's always a good sign. It means he's happy with the handling. So Emerson now has to give chase. And he comes out a good four and a half seconds ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi. So Michael Andretti is still running at the front. The question is, can he finish here? It's been very difficult for him in the past. But Michael Andretti, for the moment, in the Kmart Havlin car, is running at the front of this field. In second place, it's Fittipaldi. Third place is Mario Andretti. And fourth place is Bobby Rahal. Al Unser Jr. runs in fifth. We'll be back with more from the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix right after this. of the Indy cars in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. And today it's brought to you by Pioneer. When you put a Pioneer six-disc CD system in your car, you get a lot more out of your music. And by PPG, the world leaders in automotive finishes. Zone running in sixth. John Andretti is in seventh. Mario, Ari, and John are all a lap down. Two laps down in eighth place. Scott Brayton, then Danny Sullivan, Eddie Cheever, Mike Croft. Tony Bettenhausen runs in 12th, three laps down. Then Buddy Lazier, Didier Tays, Hiro Mashusta, Jeff Andretti, Rick Mears is out of the race now, so that gives you a pretty good idea of the order to this point. Scott Pruitt fell out early. Willie T. Ribs fell out with an oil pressure problem too bad because he's got some tremendous support from San Jose, California. And all the people out there, they put a nice press together for him to try and help with it. Here is Danny Sullivan, the alpha-powered machine, as he comes into the pits. They've carried that car all the way to the 63rd lap. But while on one hand, it's not the kind of power you want, it's got some of the fuel economy you might need. That's right. Very much a development program. We know that as Danny Sullivan leaves, burns those rear tires again. They spent some time recently down at Sebring in Florida, testing specifically for Cleveland here. Danny Sullivan was very pleased with the development they did down there. But again, it's an uphill battle because they haven't quite got to the level they need to be to be competitive. But still, they're working away on it. It takes a while to get competitive in the Indy cars, and they've indicated that they're going to stay with the battle. There was some speculation that they wouldn't be here at the end of this year, and they say, not so. We're sticking with this fight in the Indy cars. So Danny Sullivan in the Miller car doing everything he can to get up to the front of the order. So the complexion of the race has gone back and forth. On the start of the race, it was Al Unser Jr. that jumped the start with a great move, perfectly legal move. Moved up, took the lead. Right away, it was taken away by Fittipaldi. Battle developed between Fittipaldi and Michael Andretti for most of the run. And then just before these pit stops, Michael was able to get ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi. The Newman Haas team making a spectacularly good stop for Michael as he came in and kept him in the lead of the race. And that's when the pit crews are so critical, especially here on a road course. There's very little chance for any mistake at all. And when you're running 180 miles an hour or so, well, a one-second mistake in a pit stop, that can cost you about 200 yards on the racetrack. Michael Andretti, he's out in front. Michael has actually won two of the last three races, elevating himself to third place now in the PPG point standings. We ask him, what are his plans, his strategy for the rest of the season? Um, watching it every step of the way. I was watching it at the beginning of the year, and we gave away all those points at the beginning. I knew it was going to be tough, and so, you know, we're counting every single point. That's why we went to pole so bad, because that's worth one point. So, uh, you know, we're watching it, and, uh, you know, if we can't win, hopefully we can keep the car running and just, you know, collect points, and that, that's the plan the rest of the year. Michael Andretti, boy, is he driving the tail off of that thing. Do you see him come off that corner? Very few people drive as hard every single lap as Michael does, and, of course, what a lot of people are uh, interested in now is what's happening with his Formula One aspirations. His two tests so far were washed out with McLaren, but he is going back to Silverstone in England early in August to do a third test, and he told me earlier today he needs to know what McLaren's plans are for him very soon after that test. So Michael, what will he do next year, and can he score a championship in the IndyCars before he heads off to Formula One if that's what he wants? The front of the order, the moment, it's Michael. Stretch with the leader of the race, Michael Andretti, and this Quaker State onboard camera looking just over his right shoulder. Now he turns to the north and begins to cycle back as he continues to roll along on the runway here. There you see Michael in his office at work. 
And right now, he's doing a marvelous job because he is out in front of this field, having finally taken the lead away from Emerson Fittipaldi, and now moving nearly five seconds in front of the second place car of Fittipaldi. Now we get an opportunity to take a look at him as he makes a lap here, Derek. Watch his arm movements here. Look at this. Look how fast those are, the arms move. And he'll do it again here when he's going to turn right. Just here, look at the arm movements, trying to keep this car exactly where he wants it on the race front. The bumps and the sheer uh, strength you need to turn that steering wheel is what makes those arm movements look so violent. And when you talk about a race driver as an athlete, you think about the temperature here today in the cockpit, probably nearing 120 degrees for Michael Andretti. And when they talk about, uh, well, we've got an indication now, and there it is, the pace car is coming out. We're going to go to a full course yellow, apparently because the track has begun to break up just a bit. And that car in there is the chief steward of the series, Wally Dallenbach. Maybe Gary Gerald can give us a little further update. Paul, indeed we can. We see the crowd standing in the bleachers. They're wanting to know what's going on. I think we have the answer because we saw Billy Camphouse and one of the hardworking cart officials going crew to crew. We were trying to find out what was going on. Drivers are complaining about track conditions. Those marbles that we heard Scott Goodyear talk about, Rick Mears talk about, it's tough. Emerson Fittipaldi was told by his crew on the radio, and in one word, he said conditions are bad. We think that's why we're getting the yellow now. They may have to go out and sweep the track, as we've seen in years past past at Portland and once here at Cleveland trying to get it uh, in better shape for the final laps of this race. Well we got an idea of it there Gary while you were talking as the full course yellow is out and the course marshals begin to signal all the cars to slow down get behind the pace car. A couple of shots we saw that course is really and there's one of them. Look at all of the debris not just on the outside of the line but actually in the line the drivers are kicking it up it makes the car a little unstable in the corner but it also means that debris like that's getting picked up by these very sticky tires and flung backwards into the car behind him so this is the problem they face here it's the one that we mentioned just a little bit earlier they'll have to evaluate this situation and decide what it is that they're going to do certainly for the moment they're full course yellow and they're going to clean this race course We'll be back with more from the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix as Allinger Jr. visor up, motors around. Now trying to scrub this racetrack clean. What about Michael Andretti? Let's get an update from Jan Bikas. Michael has just called in on the radio and said the conditions are terrible and he almost crashed a couple of times. They called over the card officials, the crew did that is, and they said the track's really getting bad. Isn't there any way we can stop the race? The crew's always trying to find a way to get that victory early. Paul? Oh, in other words, what Michael would love to see is, wow, this is terrible out here. I think we ought to flag it right now, especially since I'm in front. <laughs> Go down to Emerson's pit and see what they say. They'll say, no, let's keep this thing we'll going. We'll go a little longer. That was Wally Dallenbach, the chief steward of the series. See him pull up in one of the PPG safety vehicles there as he is personally out on the circuit now, though still in radio contract with his race control, trying to keep track of what's going on here as we look down from the Goodyear blimp, the spirit of Akron, as... These cameras from overhead, there it is, floating in a very hot July afternoon sky and keeping us appraised of some of the intervals between these cars. Not just a, just a big advertisement up there, it really helps in the coverage of motorsports. Shots like that as the field now slowing down, lining up, and you can see the course workers working on those lines, trying to get this course just as clean as they can. When people ask about the groove in a racetrack, there's a great shot of what they call the groove. The groove is laid down by the tires, cars running over the same spot of road all the time. It eventually gets very black, and that's what the race drivers refer to as the groove. So the race is slowed under a full course yellow, and that's gonna have an adverse effect on any potential race record they had. Here is Michael Andretti. He talked about the trouble he was having. <laughs> oh, can you believe he got away with that? Puts the two outs. He's still in the gray right here. Look, he's about a full car width out of the A. Oh, he almost hits the wall. I'll tell you what, nifty piece of driving. That car was sliding over the marbles on the approach to the corner, and he actually was out of control for two full corners there. So Michael Andretti is the leader of the field right behind the PPG pace car. They'll try to get the course clean and get this race restarted just as fast as they can. Pace car brings the field around, still under full course yellow here at the Burke Lakefront Airport as they still try to get this course clean. Let's go down for some updates. First, Gary Gerald. 
there's concerns other than the track conditions, Paul. Funny how these things happen in racing, but Barry Green and the crew for Bobby Rahal, they're wanting to know what's the situation with Mario Andretti. Came into the pits, apparently there was a wing adjustment, a very quick stop, then back out. They think that he gained some positions under the course of the yellow. They want a clarification. They've called a couple of card officials over. They're working on that situation, they being the officials. We haven't heard a definitive answer just yet. Let's now check in further up pit road with Jan Bikas. Well, I may have that answer for you, Gary, because I am here in the Mario pit, and they said, yeah, he came in for a wing adjustment. He needed a change on the car, and he got down the pits quick, and he did improve position, very similar to what happened to Rick Mears last year at Nazareth. Paul? I think there is a uh, legitimate question, though, on the blend line. It looks like Mario may have picked up two positions. There he is, sitting outside of Allenser Jr., and the rule is simply that he has to be back in the position that he should be in by the time the green flag comes out. But there still seems to be a little bit of an argument of where he ought to be. What we have here is he knows he should be behind Ray Hall. He moved back. But Al Jr. thinks he should be behind him also. So look, he's tucked right in behind Ray Hall, trying to make it as difficult for Mario as possible to blend in. So a bit of an argument on the circuit there as Mario Andretti tries to find the right place in the lineup. And Al Hunter Jr., of course, like any driver, is going to say, I'm pretty sure, Mario, it's just behind me. The Pioneer Race recap here after 70 laps. Michael Andretti still the leader. We've now found ourselves in our very first full course caution, the only one of the day. And that is because of the debris being kicked up by these cars on the racetrack. They anticipated there might be a problem and it has in fact come to pass so the field now with an average speed falling rapidly of 128.6 miles an hour but still pretty good record last year's run here was at 112 miles an hour behind the pace car they still clean up sections of the circuit we hope to get going again just as soon as fast as we can the course the yellow is about to come to an end the course is as clean as they can get it that's Michael Andretti in front of the field buddy Lazier who is of course not in the fight for the lead he actually runs in 12th place right now off the pace of the leaders is between Michael Andretti and Emerson Fittipaldi so Fittipaldi certainly has his work cut out for him we'll see how he moves up and then right behind them yet Derek another battle that's right the second battle we're going to try and keep an eye on as they come down to the first turn is the Al Jr. Mario Andretti and Bobby Ray Hall battle as they come onto the pit straight now the green flag flies again from Nick Bernaro and it will be an 11 lap sprint to the finish here as they're on their way and look how fast Fittipaldi comes around Lazier looking back to see and while Scott Brayton almost catches the back end of Eddie Cheever's car and at the same time here comes Ray Hall trying to move inside Jeff Andretti and catch up to his teammate at the front of the field Fittipaldi closes in on Michael Andretti and Michael is taking these corners with some caution. He's very careful through these first corners. I think he wants to know how good a job they really did on that surface. Oh, that's right, and remember, he's the first man through at speed, so Emerson can see what's happening to Michael, so he can actually take more chances. But believe me, Michael will use everything that's available here. It's gonna be a hard job for Emerson to make a pass. Michael Andretti at the front of the field. You look down from the Goodyear blimp, and Fittipaldi on the corner closes in just a little bit, but you can see both of them still fighting a very uncertain surface. Oh, Michael absolutely fighting an oversteer condition. We see him under heavy, heavy braking here for the last chicane. That's turns 9 and 10 and accelerates in, in through the groove there. That's that black groove we spoke about earlier on. But Emerson, Emerson is right there. Very wide first corner as Emerson Fittipaldi closes in. He doesn't have the help of his wife, Teresa Fittipaldi, here today. She is still at home expecting a baby. I said, Emma, she's been expecting it for two weeks. She says, I know, I know. So Fittipaldi... Emil may need you here to flex to help as out in front, Michael Andretti, but Fittipaldi very definitely closing in. Very definitely filling the mirrors. Probably five or six car lengths. This is the most difficult part of the racetrack here. The long left-hander. Now this three right-hand section. Sandy looks on, has the stopwatch in her hand, watches every move he makes, times the gap all the time. She, every time Mike goes by, she times how far behind Emerson is so they know exactly what's happening when he closes or when he uh, pulls away. We keep our focus on the front of the field. Now we move back. Mario Andretti and Al Hunter Jr. Just ahead of them is Bobby Rahal, third, fourth, and fifth running together on the circuit. Ray Hall was able to get into third place coming off of this yellow. Then they have a separation there. There you see Scott Brayton's car. And with a very quick move to the inside, Leyendijk was trying to get past John Andretti. But right together on the 
circuit two, third, fourth, and fifth, Ray Hall, Al Unser Jr., and Mario Andretti as they fight. And of course, there's some other interested participants. Lion Dyke runs in sixth place, and he's sitting just behind Mario Andretti. Scott Brayton is actually in eighth place, but he's two laps off of the pace. That's right. The yellow flag really has put everything up for grabs here, bunched everybody up together, and really the race has come down to this last 10 lap sprint. You can make up a lot of places if you if you can get things to go your way here. Scott Brayton, though, now stands between Mario and Little Al. And as Michael Andretti roars for the flag, it will be eight laps to go next time by here in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. And there is the front of the field. There is Michael as he nails the throttle, tries to push it through the floor because he knows that Fittipaldi is right there. No question of fuel. If ever there was a question, that long yellow flag situation uh, negates any fuel problems because they don't use any while they run so slowly under the yellow flag. I use very little, but look at Emerson. Moses right up on Michael. This is turn one. Look at Michael. He slides all the way out onto the grass of that left rear wheel. Michael Andretti trying to pick up as much of an interval as he can in the sections of the circuit in which he works well. The surface, remember, is better because it's a little bit cleaner, but it's certainly not ideal. And the problems that they experienced could, in fact, happen again. Don't forget the U.S. Olympic Festival coming up from Los Angeles starting on the 13th of July. Check your local listings. It should be a great day and in fact, a great week in sports there here on ESPN. The battle still at the front. Fittipaldi is right there at the number five Marlboro machine as he continues to challenge. Roger Penske, of course, has shifted his attention along with his, uh, his driver, Rick Mears, who are both now spectators watching as the other Penske car, being very carefully handled by Chuck Sprague, is trying to chase down Michael Andretti. And they are, in fact, right together. What a great job Michael has done. We saw him off the road earlier. Oh, and John Andretti, yellows come out. John Andretti's caught the wall. Well, he's right on the racing line, too. So that will be a major problem that could cause a full course yellow. They display that yellow and red flag, which is a course condition flag. It tells you there is a slippery surface, and that's a pretty good wallop to the wall they've caught there. Now the question is, there's John getting out, thank goodness. Now this is the same wall that Rick Mears hit earlier on. We will be able to have a look at the replay. This is turn eight, coming off turn eight. Let's see what happened here, Derek. There's John, he's out in the gray, and then he just literally loses traction, bang, very hard into that outside wall, tears both their uh, left side suspensions off, but John had already looked as if he pushed out of the groove first, because when he gets into the gray, he has very little grip. There's that broken and battered all BDS car, and the course marshal's trying to tell everybody, please go to the outside of this thing. It is in a very precarious position on this course. As a pace car comes out, full course yellow, and so we will shut down again, slow the pace, and we'll be back for a very short sprint to the finish of this race. And right now we're counting down in the final five laps of this race. What they must do is get John Andretti's Pennzoil car off of the course. It was, as you saw, in a most precarious position. The kart safety team is right there. Lon Bromley leads that group, and they're going to get as much of the debris off, and then they'll have a wrecker come around, snatch the car off, and we may see as many as three laps of racing, perhaps more. Perhaps they'll get it done faster than we anticipate. But we're going to certainly see a very tight battle as we look at the PPG pace car, and just behind it, Michael Andretti, the leader of the race, and just behind Michael. Well, the battle for second place will develop. Look at Michael, though, as he gestures to different sections of the circuit. This Fittipaldi's lined up just behind him. Let's get an audio update. Here's Jan Vigas. They've been speaking with Michael Andretti on the radio, and they've been motioning for Cart to come over, and they've been saying, see what we say? The track is really bad, and the cars are going off the track. It's time to stop this event. They're trying very hard to lobby for that. We'll have to find out what Cart's response is. Paul? All right, so Michael Andretti certainly is concerned. And, you know, as we look at this uh, Quaker State on board camera, we said somewhat in a, in, with humor that, you know, that's certainly what Michael would want. But the truth is that all of the drivers will get on their radios. There'll be a round consultation. They'll talk with everybody. It won't be some last-minute kind of decision. It'll be a very calculated decision. And if they decide to, uh, to stop the race early, 
than uh, it will be because everybody decided it was a very bright thing to do, and it may be. And, of course, the final decision will rest with Wally Dollenbach, who is an ex-race driver himself, so he knows what these conditions can be like. And whenever Wally makes a decision of a serious nature like this, he knows he has the full backing of all the drivers still out there. That's the uh, good news to the two-way radio communication that they have going around this track. And then there's also just some outright visual communication. You saw it a moment ago. We may see it again as Michael Andretti will come out to different sections of the track and actually show Johnny Rutherford. Take a look at this. Radio this part back. This is a mess here. Very difficult sometimes. You can see on, on these television shots, sometimes difficult to really evaluate the surface unless you're actually riding across it. The first six cars on the track are running one, two, three, four, five, six, except Except you should expect when they come green, they're all going to be right together, and it's going to be a scramble. That is assuming we can get back to green. They certainly have the John Andretti car up on the hook now. They can clear the track quickly, and we should be able to come back to maybe three laps of green. When they come back, here's the order. Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, Bobby Rahal. Fourth place, Al Unser Jr., Mario Andretti, Ari Leyendijk. Seventh is Scott Brayton. Two laps off the lead. First through sixth are all on the same lap, as I mentioned. Then Brayton, then Cheever in eighth. Ninth is Danny Sullivan. Mike Roth is tenth. Eleventh, John Andretti, until he got into the wall. Buddy Lazier, then Didier Taves, then Tony Bettenhausen, then Jeff Andretti, then Hiro Mashusta. Those are the cars that are all running at this time. Remember, Rick Mears was the last one out with a quick slap against the wall in the same place that John Andretti got into the wall. Ted Prappas, John Andretti, of course, is out. Scott Goodyear with his electrical problem. A.J. Foyt with a problem in the suspension system. John Jones had an engine problem. And Willie T. Ribs out with an oil pressure problem. Scott Pruitt out with suspension, the very first car out. So now we wait for the green flag to fly again here at the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. And I'll tell you what, it will be a whale of a battle to the finish. His team, his car, now off of the course. We should have just one lap to go. First through sixth are lined up right behind the PPG pace car. Gary Gerald, you have an update. Yeah, Paul, we're looking at that lineup as they go through turn number one right now. For Fittipaldi, the good news is no lap cars between he and the leader, Michael Andretti, as was the case in the last restart. But the bad news is he's got Ray Hall and Unser who will be right behind him. So if he gambles and something goes wrong, then he could slide back positions. Now, we also have heard a radio report that Emerson apparently had to go from fifth to second gear dramatically in that last restart in the corner when he got around one of those cars. He consequently thinks that he may have picked up some kind of vibration in the left side tires. How much that's going to impact the handling in these last four laps, I guess we're about to find out. Paul? We certainly are as they head out toward the east end. A couple of other quick updates from this track this weekend. Darren Brassfield was the winner in the Trans Am. Mark Smith, the winner in the Indy Lights. And we want to give you an update, too, on Tommy Kendall, who we know is watching this from his hospital bed in Indianapolis, Indiana at Methodist Hospital. Good place to send a card and he is apparently facing a fairly long recovery after his accident a week ago so now well the scene is set michael andretti leads the first six cars who are all right together behind the pace car as they acknowledge the green flag this time around which should come out at this point it will be three laps to the finish of this race so we've come all of this distance nearly 200 miles now and we're going to find that this race is going to be decided in the last few laps about 14 different gear changes per laps here. 1,400 the entire race. It all comes down to this. It's the pace car cycles onto the pit road. It's all up for grab. The top six positions. The green flag is about to fly. First through six run together. The green flag is out. Two laps to go as they flash over the line. Michael Andretti out in front. There comes Rayall coming down to the inside, but they stay in line through turn one. This is the long acceleration up through turn two and turn three. This is the very heavy braking right-hander. Oh, Sandy watches, times Michael, every move he makes. On the lakeside straight, Michael Andretti picks up a bit of an advantage. Ray Hall climbs all over the back end of Fittipaldi. Al Unser Jr. is right there behind Ray Hall with a good result in his pocket if he can just keep there. Better yet, if he can get past his own teammate. And they battle, sliding second, third, fourth through the corners. Remember, the court surface still is not great. It's just a little bit better. See what happened there? Al Jr. went down the inside at turn five. Ray Hall saw what he was about to do, and he jerked down the inside to try and block the line. He wasn't going to pass Fittipaldi, but he did stop Al, Al Jr. making a pass. Michael Andretti running alone. 
When he comes to the line this time, it will be two laps to go. And the battle is back at second place. Michael has managed to pull away just a bit. The fight at second. Ray Hall coming up behind Fittipaldi. Little Al coming up behind Ray Hall. And the unsponsored Lion Dyke car sitting just behind Little Al. This is exactly what Michael needs. Emerson's hands are full. So just under two laps to go now as Ray Hall is right there doing everything he can. Let us not forget the elder Andretti runs in sixth place right now and he is fighting this leader battle as well. Little Al moves over to the inside. Ray Hall cuts a little early to protect the line. Same move that again. Goes, that goes advantage to Fittipaldi. Exactly. Same move again. Al Jr. went down the inside. Ray Hall blocked him and Emerson pulls two car lengths. First place Michael Andretti. You see him cycle off the corner as you look at the difference. And first place moving second is now a four car fight and Ari Leinak is right there he's absolutely behind Al Jr. watching everything that's going on but they're strung out a little bit here under heavy braking this is the last turn nine and ten decision time now as the white flag comes out just a tick over two miles one lap to go for Michael Andretti he has not finished here in a very long time will he finish in the top spot very likely but it's not over until that checkered flag comes out and the battle for second place continues to heat up surface is very very slick anything can happen at this point michael is certainly well aware of that but he's also well aware if he hesitates even for a moment then finipaldi ray hall hunter jr and lion dyke are going to be right on top of him and ray hall continues to work for second place right behind emerson finipaldi ray hall keeping emerson honest and on his toes here but lion dyke made an attempt earlier on to get by by alonso jr but look at ray hall this is his last chance this is the only time he can make a pass under heavy braking here for turn nine michael andretti runs all alone here is the battle and ray hall's going to try the brakes but it won't work here he climbs in behind Fittipaldi. they come onto the pit straight the twin checkered flags out for michael andretti michael andretti has scored the win and ray hall springs out alongside of emerson Fittipaldi. but Fittipaldi comes across the line in second ray hall in third Alonzo jr fourth Ari lion dyke fifth and mario Michael, the only man to score multiple wins in this season. A spectacular win for Michael Andretti on a very, very hot afternoon in Cleveland. And they have really taken on all the odds. The heat, the roughness of the circuit, and the fact that much of this circuit has actually been breaking up through most of the day. And boy, take a look at that. Ed Nathman, the team manager for Newman Haas. <laughs> when you win, it does feel awfully good. Awfully good. What a great day when a situation like this happens. Michael Andretti, arguably the fastest man in IndyCar racing at the moment, made a tremendous statement this afternoon just how hard he had to drive. We had great camera footage of him off the racetrack earlier on, got on the grass, had the car sideways, got out of the groove on the next turn, out of control for two corners, brings it back on. All the adversity still takes it home. Look at that number one finger in the air. And try this one out. Even with two full course cautions, one of them quite lengthy. It's a new track record. Race record, 117.76 miles an hour for Michael Andretti, who will take the lion's share of the $750,000 purse here in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. A long, hot afternoon, 201.3 miles. And Sandy is saying, where's Michael? I got a cold drink for him. And most of all, a great congratulations. Michael has picked up the win. First, second, and third. Now roll to a stop. Their engine silent for the first time today right on the center of the pit road. And Michael Andretti climbs out of the car. What a happy man he must be. This is going to make a big difference in the points count for Michael. And he is now, without question, the force to be reckoned with here in the midseason in the Indy cards, especially considering that we have ahead in a week the Meadowlands and in two weeks Toronto, both road courses. And Michael has certainly proved that he is the master when it comes to these road circuits. Now let's go down and Gary Gerald with our winner. And indeed, that cool drink has got to feel awful good. This is a tough day's work. I understand you had brakes going away late. You guys don't miss a trick, do you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I didn't want to mention too much over the radio so the other guys wouldn't know, but uh, 
after the cautions, I guess, guess I boiled my fluid under the caution and uh, I had a very long pedal the, the last, the whole last part after the first yellow. So it was, uh, it was a little closer than most people thought. What was the emotion when you got that last yellow and you knew that Emerson and everybody else was going to have a chance to challenge again? I wasn't happy about it, but uh, you know, what can you do? That's, that's the breaks of the game. And, uh, you know, luckily we were able to come out on the right. Tell us about the track conditions now, because we kept hearing reports from various drivers, yourself included, that it was very, very difficult. Was it dangerous? A little bit. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was getting really bad, but then they swept it, then it got a little bit better. Yeah, it was starting to get worse again. But uh, you know, I guess to, to put the, the green out for the last three laps is okay because they knew the track wasn't going to break up too much from then. This really does wonders for your bid now for a championship as you can close some ground. But, of course, Ray Hall is, again, a top-five finisher. I know. He keeps doing that. He's going to be tough. But, uh, you know, right now we're doing everything we can. Congratulations. Michael Andretti savers this one. Let's go now to uh, Jan Bikas with Emerson Fittipaldi. Emerson Fittipaldi has just gotten out of his Marlboro car, and he's very, very hot. He reaches for the water. He wants to make sure he has that water. How tough was it out there today with those track conditions? Well, it was very tough. When I was in the race, I nearly spun three times, and... Uh, you know, the last 10 laps, I, I ran out of clutch. I had a, pro a lot of problems changing gears and braking. I was very slow into the brake. Uh, that's that's what happened. But now, one stage you had a big lead, and we heard a report that possibly you'd missed a gear that had allowed Michael to close in? Well, I nearly spun off. I got in the loose stuff. I went very wide. I had to back off, and uh, that's when Michael caught, caught me. So do you think the difference was being able to be consistent in the bad conditions as opposed to you think you guys are about the same speed on the track when you're running? Well, I think mid-race, Michael Possible was running faster than I was. Uh, the last segment, I should be fast, but then I run out of clutch. Okay, you guys are really picking up the heat here in the late part of the season. Let's go back up to Paul. Emerson Fittipaldi, after a great battle, finishes in second place. Michael Andretti, who came off of the Long Beach race, 17th in the points, now moves into second place, just 10 points behind Bobby Rahal. We'll be back with more. over Lake Erie looking down on the Burke Lakefront Airport which very very shortly will become an airport once again believe me they clean these runways off quite quickly now the uh, spirit of Akron the airship we see there is not going to land here but there are a lot of jets and private airplanes that like to use this airport they will be able to use it shortly because the Indy cars are done at least for the 10th running here in the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix and Michael Andretti's name is at the top of the order as he has won in a marvelous battle with Emerson Fittipaldi. Bobby Rahal is finishing in third. These are unofficial at the moment. Al Unser Jr. is fourth. Ari Leindyke with a really a splendid run in fifth place. Some sponsor really must look at that car now. In sixth place, Mario Andretti. Scott Brayton in seventh. Eddie Cheever in eighth place. Ninth unofficially, Danny Sullivan. And tenth with another splendid run is Mike Groff. So now, many of those who have been in the yachts begin to go away, but we do not. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Bobby Rahal is in the cockpit of his car, and he's been under a heavy physical regimen in recent months, a lot of bicycle riding. I hope it paid off today, because this is about as tough in an Indy car as it gets from a physical standpoint. You know, it's not so much the heat here. Um, it's, just, it's so rough, you know, and it got rougher as the race progressed because the track kept coming up, and, uh, I mean, you just take a pound in, and it just, uh, after a while, it hurts almost, but... Uh, you know, I'm not sure if we had our car 100%, but it ran strong all through the race. And uh, my pit crew did a Gallus Craco guys. You know, once again, you know, they got me ahead of Al. And uh, sorry, Maury, it's not a win, but we'll get him next time. Maury Cranes, as we've indicated earlier, reconvalescing from back surgery in Southern California. You had the run with the yellow there to try to close on Emerson, and you were really knocking on that door continually. Yeah, I tried to. Uh, he can. It seems he can pull me a little bit like mid gears, like fourth, fifth gear. Because I was staying with him off the corners, and I'd lose a little bit, and I'd close up under brake. And once or twice, I thought maybe we might have a shot, but uh, just ran out of room. Season points leader protecting that lake. Congratulations, Bobby. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to have come away with a win, but we'll get him next week. All right, those seconds and thirds piling up as we go to Jan Bikas. All right, Lion Dyke, a great run for you. You had a chance to make a couple moves there right in the end. Yeah, right at the end, uh, you know, the yellow really helped me because I was 15 seconds behind Mario and I passed him when he slid off the course uh, on the pebbles there on the uh, outside of the group. And I was able to challenge uh, little Al and I kind of snuck up beside him, but, you know, just didn't have enough laps. And uh, but the car felt good at the end and I'm really, uh, really happy with the way uh, the crew did their job in the pits. They got me in and out really fast and, uh, you know, the car ran good uh, all day and... Uh, 
Right now, our team is in the middle of uh, looking for sponsorship, and it's something that we really need bad since, you know, today with the fifth place, we're still right up there in the points. There's a flood of reporters here. Yeah, as many people here, as certainly as Michael did for winning the race because of the fact of all this team stuff. Will you be at the Meadowlands? Uh, we will be at the Meadowlands, and we will be at Toronto, and after that, uh, we'll just have to see what happens. Ari Leindijk with one of his best runs, but they're looking for sponsors. Paul? Ari Leindijk, a fifth-place finish, puts him third in the points. The points are now Ray Hall with 104, Michael Andretti 10 back with 94, Ari Leindijk third place with 79, Al Unser Jr. 78, Fittipaldi 77, and Rick Mears, who started in second place, has dropped down to six in the points right now. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Mario Andretti is alongside, waiting to get an opportunity to go back and legitimately cool off. Mario, this was where you got the last win three years ago, and for much of the early part of this race today, it looked like you might be a factor again at the end. Any particular problems that you had to chase? Yeah, the car was perfect, other than uh, I was bottoming have very heavily on the front. And we're going to try to see why. Somehow it seemed like we might have lost just a... Uh, hair of height, uh, right height, you know, like it could be a sixteenth of an inch or something. And uh, especially in the critical corners where it was breaking up, I was, I had to be right on the apex. And when I would bottom, the car would just jump. And a couple of times, I just wound up in the grass, and uh, that really hurt me. I just, How much did this course change from the last time you were on it yesterday until this morning session and the race this afternoon? Well, it changed because uh, after the previous races they had a trans am race i think uh, the track that just got destroyed uh, uh, where they had sealer down it just peeled off and then the track got very marbly so it was it was a shame because it was a very good track until yesterday afternoon was it a dangerous condition today not dangerous was a bit of a nuisance and uh, if you as i say if you had any little problem you miscue your line and then you just had in the marbles well we'll see you next week at the meadowlands look forward to it all right thank you mario paul Mario Andretti, what is uh, a nuisance for him would be devastating to the rest of us. Mario Andretti with a really spectacular run comes home in sixth place. His son Michael is the winner here at the Budweiser Cleveland Grand Prix. We'll be back with more right after this. Back in Cleveland as Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Bobby Rahal, first, second, and third, hoist their trophies now on the victory program. PPG IndyCar World Series now has scored yet another race here the 10th at the Cleveland Burke Lakefront Airport and they go through all these ceremonies and not far away many of the other drivers watch one of them is Eddie Cheever here's Gary Gerald Ed Wall after a tough day in the cockpit is Eddie Cheever who finishes eighth today Eddie we've been talking with a variety of drivers about the conditions and how physically rough it got today how bad was it in your seat a lot of it depends on how your car is handling and how it rides over the bump. I mean, my car today over all the bumps was very hard, and I think something broke halfway through the race in the rear. We're trying to find out what it is, but uh, it was one of those days where I earned my money. I earn my money all the time when I'm doing this, but today I should have had extra pay because it was a very difficult race to run. But, um, you know, our, our, our car, our team is doing well. We've just got to keep on progressing and make everything go a bit better. The conditions today were particularly difficult, and we've been... We're like a dog chasing its tail for the past three days, and we never quite got a hold of it. <laughs> An interesting way to describe it. I know that frequently you wear protection on your lower legs or your shins. Do you have that today? And did it? Did you get pounded against the the rack of the uh, steering column and so forth? Uh, I, I have to wear that all the time because these Lolas are made for a very small Italian family called Andretti's, and anybody that's above <laughs> five foot four, they don't really fit very well into them. But uh, that wasn't the biggest problem. Uh, um, it's just. It's, it's just hot, bumpy, and um, that's just the way it is. I mean, the easier the car is to drive, the better off you're going to be. I'm sure my target Lola Scotch will be very quick in Meadowlands, and I wish you were there already. Well, it won't be long, and we'll be there, and hopefully it'll be a little cooler, and the conditions will be a little better for everybody to handle. All right. I don't mind the conditions as long as the car handles well. That's All right. Here's a man who wants a better handling race car. Maybe he'll have it next weekend. We'll find out. Paul? In fact, you'll see that race from the Meadowlands. His car owner, Chip Canassi, is also the promoter of the race at the Meadowlands, which you will see here on ESPN just a week away now as Eddie Cheever looks for something cold to drink and an opportunity to relax. As How's this for a seat? Maybe the best seat in the house, just a few feet off of the edge of the uh, seawall here on Lake Erie. Let's go back into this race because we have a chance now to analyze some key parts. Here is Michael Andretti. 
and this is a demonstration of how really slick and marbly this course was getting. That's right. This is one of the most dramatic moments in the race because Michael gets into turn seven and eight way too hard, and look how he gets onto the grass. Now watch as the car gets away. Watch him get on opposite lock here. Still out of the groove here, out in the gray. Very, very difficult. Very lucky to get away. Now watch how close he comes to hitting the wall here. This is where John Andretti and Rick Mears crashed. And look at Michael here. He's out in the groove. He's what, 12, 18 inches away from the wall, out of control. And that's what separates Michael Andretti from ordinary men. Look at the brake lines, now acceleration lines, as he comes away. If you notice, going into the corner, despite the fact he's trying to turn, he's also trying to modulate the brakes and keep himself away from the wall. A nifty piece of driving that also means that Michael Andretti ends up as the winner of this race. So at the Burke Lakefront Airport, very quiet now. In fact, already the uh, crews from the airport are getting ready to land their first airplanes. We'll be back with more right after this. Averaging 117.7 miles an hour, Michael Andretti has broken the race record by nearly five miles an hour and taken the 17th win of his career, tying him, by the way, on the all-time list with Ralph Mulford, whose first IndyCar win came on a board track in Sheepshead Bay, New York in 1919. So Michael is now 16th all-time career wins. Followed as we take a look down through the entire final standings, a great battle with Fittipaldi throughout the day. Nice run for Mike Groff, Cosworth power. Not bad for Danny Sullivan with the alpha-powered machine. No, the first cars were all Chevrolet, Buddy Lazier. Very, very nice run here today. And how sad we are to see some cars out so early, most notably Willie Ribb, Scott Pruitt, and A.J. Foyt. What is all of this today due to the point standings? Well, it moves Michael Andretti up into second place. He could surpass Bobby Rahal next week at the Meadowlands. Ari Leyendijk, still unsponsored, stays in third place. What a great opportunity for somebody. Alanzer Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Rick Mears, all still very, very tight in the points. As we approach the halfway point in the PPG and e car season, well, it's a whale of a fight that we have now. Next, it's on to the Meadowlands of New Jersey, the New York area. Well, We'll be live here on ESPN 2.30 Eastern next Sunday as the Indy cars return to battle and the PPG points fight continues as well. It's been a long, hot afternoon, and Michael Andretti has triumphed at the top.